Hello, and welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. Thank you for listening. My name is Matt. This week, we're going to be talking about Christopher Columbus and the Spanish colonization of the New World. I intended to talk about this topic last time, however, as sometimes happens with me, I got distracted on some historical tangents that I found pretty interesting. So I told myself that this week I was going to stay on target. I was going to talk about Christopher Columbus and not let myself get distracted. So, naturally, I'm about to talk to you about the Mongol Empire. As most of you are probably aware, the Mongol Empire, at its height during the Middle Ages, spanned most of Asia, the majority of what's now called the Middle East, and even into parts of Russia and Europe. It was a huge amount of territory. The Mongolian Empire was massive. Now, after the initial conquest, some internal strife, civil wars, and dynastic struggles, the Mongol Empire reached a period of relative peace and stability. There was a saying about this period in time, a period in time known to historians as the Pax Mongolica, a maiden bearing a nugget of gold on her head could wander safely through the realm. Now, even if that's propaganda, that kind of goes to show you that at the time it must have been a peaceful and therefore relatively prosperous time. The reason it was prosperous, as is true just about any other period in history, is because when things are peaceful, trade is allowed to flourish. And in the Mongolian Empire, trade flourished, as we all know, along the Silk Road. We mentioned the Silk Road last week. It was, of course, the trading route through which goods got from Southeast Asia, areas like China, through the Middle East into Europe. It was extremely important, and lots of people were getting very, very rich because of this peaceful trade agreement. The Europeans were getting all the exotic spices and all the exotic goods they needed, and the Mongol leaders and the people in places like the Byzantine Empire, the Mongol-held Middle East, India, China, essentially everywhere that the Silk Road ran through, were getting quite a few goods in return, as well as very, very wealthy. You could hope that an agreement in a situation like this could last forever. However, of course, it's not going to. The Silk Road eventually fell into disrepair. This was for a number of reasons. The first, and most important, being the fall of the Mongol Empire. There were a lot of root causes to the fall of the Mongol Empire. There was a lot of internal tension building between the different khans ruling different areas that were struggling to find a balance of power. But one of the biggest ones would have to be the Black Death, the bubonic plague. It struck the Mongol Empire very, very hard, very, very early, and very quickly. I'd like to give a brief, brief rundown of how fast the Black Death moved. The first generally accepted record of an outbreak of the bubonic plague happened in 1334 in China. A mere 10 years later, in 1344, India, Alexandria, and Egypt, and all the way up into Constantinople, that's all the way through the Middle East, all had reports of outbreaks of the Black Death. That's essentially the whole of the Mongol Empire in 10 years. Now, three years after that, in 1347, it had hit Europe. A, uh, a group of Genoese sailors landed in Sicily, bearing the Black Death. One year later, by 1348, the Black Death reached the shores of England. That's a mere 14 years that the Black Death went from Southeast Asia, the southeast parts of China, all the way through the Eurasian continent to get to a little tiny island up in the very, very northwest. Essentially, all of Europe, all of the Middle East, parts of Africa, and all of Asia was struck by the Black Death, and this killed upwards of 50% of the population in many places. It was devastating. Things just couldn't work the way they had been working forever. So naturally, the Mongol Empire fell. Now, it wasn't, of course, just the Black Death, but their strength waned when that hit. Their strength waned, and unfortunately for the Mongols, the Muslim peoples were becoming strong again. There was a movement of resurgence against their Mongol overlords to give the Muslims self-rule again. This movement grew until several smaller states appeared, and then, of course, strongmen began to coalesce those smaller states into stronger and stronger units. It took a little over a hundred years, but in the year 1453, the very last vestige of what one would consider the Roman Empire, the city of Constantinople, the capital of Byzantium, fell 
to the Ottoman Turks. This fall of Constantinople is really what I wanted to get to, because that directly affected Christopher Columbus. You see, before the fall of Constantinople, the Genoese had been, well, traders primarily. Genoa was a major trading port that was becoming very, very wealthy for many, many years because of trade with the Middle East that happened primarily through Constantinople around the Mediterranean. But with the fall of Constantinople, the Genoese were forced to rethink how they were going to make their money. Trade was not panning out and making them as much money as they'd hoped it would. So all of these people who traded primarily on the Mediterranean looked around and they said, well, we've got lots of money and we've got lots of ships, but we're not getting any goods to trade. So what are we going to do with all of this money and ships? The natural solution is to start fitting and financing expeditions that other people will undertake. Now, Christopher Columbus was born in the year 1451. That was two years before Constantinople fell. So as Genoa is changing, and thusly all of Europe is changing because of the disappearance of trade with the East, Christopher Columbus is growing up in this time when Europe is trying to figure out a new identity for itself. He's really a product of that new Europe. Now, I said just a second ago that Christopher Columbus was born in Genoa. This is generally accepted by most historians. However, not all historians agree on this. There are historians that say that Christopher Columbus was, in fact, Spanish. Most of these historians seem to be from Spain. There are some that claim he was Portuguese. Most of those seem to be Portuguese. There are some that claim he was Greek. In fact, the one person who claimed he was Greek, we know, was, in fact, Greek. I do know somebody who has a professor that swears that his grandmother has documents that prove Christopher Columbus is Greek, but, of course, she refuses to let those out into the world. The thing that you'll take away from this is that Christopher Columbus is a character that people want to claim for themselves because he's one of the most respected and one of the greatest explorers of all time, and people from wherever has any claim on Christopher Columbus would like to be able to claim that that's what he is. However, most people believe and agree that Christopher Columbus was Genoese. However, he did move to Portugal very early in his life. Now, essentially all of Columbus's life, the Europeans had been looking for a sea route to Asia. See, Christopher Columbus was a mariner, and he was earning his chops in a time when all of the mariners that he was working under and respected would probably talk about things like, well, what's the best way to get to Asia now? Oh, did you hear about that new piece of news somebody found about how to get to Asia? And so this was probably on his mind for his entire life. There were other European explorers who had thought about going west through what they called the Ocean Sea, what we now call the Atlantic Ocean, to get to the Indies. This, there is a common misconception that people at the time thought the earth was flat, and I'd just like to go ahead and nip that in the bud. People at the time did not think the earth was flat. The church did not think the earth was flat. Essentially, anybody who had any learning at all knew the earth was round. This was true not only of the Europeans of this era, but the Romans and the ancient Greeks and the Chinese and basically anybody who had any sort of seafaring experience under their belt. This misconception that people at the time thought the Earth was flat probably comes originally from a Washington Irving biography of Christopher Columbus, published in 1828, that claimed that the Catholic Church denounced the belief that the Earth was round and that Christopher Columbus must be a heretic for doing so, which I can't say for certain, but coming from an early American writer, there was a strong anti-Catholic sentiment in those early years of the American Republic, so that may have been a bit of propaganda to talk about how foolish the Catholics were not to know that you could find your way around the world. Considering that the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, the ancient Chinese, and basically everybody since people started sailing on the oceans knew that the earth was round. The next time that you're on Twitter and some celebrity starts giving you this flat earther nonsense, you should just go ahead and unfollow them. And then, after you're done with that, why not go over to the Pirate History Podcast at Black Flagcast and follow them? You're going to get much better information. So, while Christopher Columbus is sailing under other captains, there are many captains and many explorers that are trying to find the sea route to Asia by going west. Most of those expeditions never returned, and the few that did came limping back into port months later, most of the seamen dead, the very few that were alive barely surviving. 
For anybody that financed expeditions, be they naval officers or nobility or even royalty, it was a huge expense and a great risk. And the way that most of them saw it, if history was any guide, traveling west into the ocean sea was an even more foolish expenditure that would almost certainly lose them lots of money, and perhaps a ship or two. So you can imagine how hard of time Columbus must have had finding anybody to finance his expedition. At the time, people were scrambling all throughout Europe to get financing to find perhaps safer routes to Asia. In 1488, Bartholomew Diaz rounded the Cape of Good Hope, the southern tip of Africa, which was the first stepping stone to finding the most feasible sea route to Asia. So anybody who thought that west was the way to go had to move faster and faster. Columbus scrambled all throughout Europe trying to find financing. He went to England, he went to France, he tried Portuguese, and nowhere was he finding anybody who would listen. But finally, in Spain, the Catholic monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, were somewhat more amenable. As the Reconquista drew to a close, remember, the Reconquista was the reconquest of the Iberian Peninsula from the Caliphate of Cordoba, as it drew to a close, the Catholic monarchs were able to turn their mind towards more internal matters. These internal matters were the forced conversion, or expulsion, or even the execution of all non-Catholics in their realms. As you can imagine, for anybody who was either Jewish or Muslim or not sufficiently Catholic for the liking of those in charge, this was a terrible time. For the ruling class, the lust for converts, as well as the lust for riches and the lost treasures of the Orient, well, these were all almost equal in measure, so it left the Catholic monarchs, as well as the court nobility, very open for perhaps more risky ventures. It should be noted that Isabella was a bit less conservative than Ferdinand in her openness to some of these suggestions for these more dangerous ventures, as well as more open to the counsel of some of her religious advisors at court. In her stellar History of the Caribbean, Empire's Crossroads, historian Carrie Gibson gives a much better account of these court advisors, as well as the mindset of Ferdinand and Isabella, than I could hope to. Quote, Many were not persuaded by his calculations, but Columbus did manage to convince two friars in Andalusia, Juan Perez and Antonio de Marchena, who had the ear of Isabella and could give him credibility in court. She continues, The Catholic monarchs were both enticed by the riches of the East, which could also help to recoup the losses of fighting in Grenada. They, too, would have known the stories of Marco Polo and the work of the Jesuit missionaries who had traveled the long route to the East and later sent reports back to Europe. They would have been delighted at the prospect of their newly united and powerful kingdom of Castile and Aragon making its presence known among other non-believers. It was almost too tempting to resist. The gold and the spices of the Orient, as well as new peoples ripe for conversion. End quote. Despite the backing of these two friars that had Isabella's ear, the rest of the nobility at court didn't exactly share the same confidence in Columbus. Columbus believed that the earth was much smaller than it actually is. He had calculated the distance between Spain and his intended destination of Japan, which was called, at the time, Champagu, I believe I pronounced that at least close to correctly, as 2,400 miles between Spain and Japan. In reality, the distance is closer to 10,600 miles, which some of the more learned men in Isabella's court had calculated much more closely. However, that really didn't bother Isabella. She decided to put her faith in Columbus. There were many reasons that this might be the case. It's possible that it was just bravado. Spain was doing incredibly well, and perhaps she believed that anything they undertook would succeed. Perhaps it was be religious belief. You know, these two friars believed in Columbus, and anything that they seemed to be doing was going well, so perhaps God had her back as well. Or perhaps there was a more emotional reason for it. Isabella was, after all, the grandniece of Henry the Navigator. With Isabella's backing, he finally had the royal support he needed, and was able to get his three famous ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, as well as the funds, to supply his ships and pay his sailors. So... On August 3rd, 1492, Columbus set sail. The first leg of his journey was well known. He stopped at the Canary Islands to restock and resupply. When he was done there, he finally sailed, due west, 
into the unknown. By all accounts, it was an easy journey. They had over-provisioned just in case, and the winds appeared to be with them. Regardless, the sailors on the Santa Maria were beginning to get nervous. I imagine that all the sailors were beginning to get nervous. You see, all of the men who had attempted this voyage before this and returned to Europe had not sailed as far as the men in these three ships had. They knew that they were in essentially uncharted and unknown waters, and the unknown is still one of the most powerful motivating factors in the human psyche. Now this manifested itself on Columbus's journey when on October 6th, the sailors on the Santa Maria attempted a mutiny. However, their fears were put to rest because one of the other ships had seen birds just the day before, and birds are a sure sign of land nearby, so they knew that they were close to land and soon they would find it. Which happened a mere six days later, on October 12th, 1492, land was sighted. Upon going ashore, the first act they did was to plant a flag with the Royal Cross of Spain, as well as the letters F and Y, standing for Ferdinand and Isabella. Isabella was at the time sometimes spelled with a Y. Columbus had read the works of Marco Polo. He had also read the works of several other missionaries and explorers and traders that had traveled to the east, so he thought he had some idea of what to expect. I'd like to give you a little bit of an idea of what he was expecting by reading a bit from Marco Polo's journals. Quote, There is gold there in very great abundance, but the monarch does not easily permit it to be taken away from the island, and consequently few traders go there, and rarely do ships from other regions land at its ports. The king of the island has a large palace with a very fine gold roof in the manner in which we line churches with lead. The windows of this palace are all trimmed with gold, and the paving in the halls and many rooms is covered with slabs of gold which are two fingers thick. There are also many precious stones, and for this reason the island of Chimpagu is marvelously rich. End quote. Can you imagine a palace that rich? A palace with a ceiling made of gold, slabs of gold two inches thick lining the floors, and so rich that the windows themselves are trimmed with gold? I'm sure the Europeans could in their wildest dreams, but I imagine they saw it as sort of a frivolous waste of wealth. Maybe saw the people of the Orient as people who didn't respect their wealth as they thought they should. Unfortunately for Columbus, though, the island that he landed on, which he christened San Salvador, didn't have any palaces made of gold. Didn't have any palaces at all. In fact, had no structures. He didn't see any people there except for just a few naked Indians. At this moment, expecting to see the riches of the Orient, well, that must have been one of the more confusing times in Columbus's life. You see, Columbus took the works of Marco Polo to heart. He believed in these palaces made of gold, so it must have been of some comfort to him that despite the fact that there were no lavish peoples or lavish palaces around, well, there was another note that Columbus made in his journals about a passage from Marco Polo, which I'd like to continue to read to you. Quote, the number of islands in India is so numerous that no living being could recount all of their qualities. So the sailors and pilots of those regions affirm, and from what is known from the sea charts and from observing the compasses of the Indian Sea, there are 1,378 islands at least in the sea, and all, they say, are inhabited. And so Columbus was undaunted. He decided to move on in his exploration of what he firmly believed were the Indies. He explored some more of the Bahamanian islands a bit, but his first major find was Cuba. He was heard to have said of Cuba that it was larger than England and Scotland taken together, which it's not. However, Cuba is a very big island, so Columbus may be forgiven for making such a statement. His next major find was the island that would be known as Hispaniola. To quote Columbus again, Hispaniola is a miracle. Mountains and hills, plains and pastures are both fertile and beautiful. The harbors are unbelievably good, and there are many wide rivers of which the majority contain gold. There are many spices and great mines of gold and other metals. Columbus continues, Its inhabitants, and those of all the other islands that I saw or learned of, always go naked as the day they were born, except that some women cover their private parts with a leaf or spray of foliage, or a piece of common cloth which they make for that purpose. End quote. The very reason that the Silk Road is named the Silk Road is not because of the spices and not because of the china and not because of the exotic goods or the drugs. It is because of silk, which was one of the most hotly contested and important commodities brought from the East to Europe. 
Europeans had a heavy taste for silk, and they knew that it came from what they called the Orient. So you would think that Columbus would see these natives going naked, not clothed in silk, not wearing gold jewelry and having no palaces of the lavish luxury that he had been led to expect. You would think that some part of him, maybe buried deep inside, would start to think, maybe I haven't found the Orient. Maybe I've found something entirely new. But for Columbus's part, he would never ever admit for the rest of his life that what he had found was in fact the Caribbean, and not, as he believed, the Indian Ocean. Near Christmas Day, 1492, the Santa Maria ran aground. Columbus decided that since the Santa Maria was not seaworthy and they didn't have the space on board his other two ships to take everybody home, to leave a garrison of 39 soldiers on the island on which it ran aground. He commanded these soldiers to establish a gold mine there, and due to the proximity to Christmas, they named the settlement La Navidad. I'd like to ask, if you were left with 38 other people in an alien land with no way to provide for yourself, do you think that between the hours that you spent hunting and the hours that you spent fishing and foraging for food, as well as building a much-needed shelter, would you have time, personally, to begin mining for gold? I don't think you would. So it's likely that the implied directive Columbus gave those men was to enlist the help of the native peoples of that island. However, those people had lives of their own and duties that they had to attend to every day that did not include toiling underground in a dangerous and dark gold mine. In fact, toiling isn't the right word. They didn't have time to slave away in a dangerous and dark gold mine. Columbus had said of the native peoples of the region, which were sometimes called Arawaks, quote, They were well built, with good bodies and handsome features. They do not bear arms and do not know them, for I showed them a sword, and they took it by the edge and cut themselves out of ignorance. They have no iron. Their spears are made of cane. They would make fine servants. With fifty men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. End quote. Soon after establishing the colony at La Navidad, Columbus left to go back to Europe. On board, he carried with him exotic fruits, several animals, some of the goods that he had traded with the natives. He had also put on board what little gold he was able to gather, but really that amounted to no more than a few small nuggets. Of the prime interest to those back in Europe, he had managed to convince somehow, probably by force, a few natives to get on board and go back to Europe with him. These native people were unlike anybody the Europeans had ever seen before. They didn't look like Africans, they didn't look like Arabs, they didn't look like people from the Far East. The closest thing they could be compared to were the native Canary Islanders, but there was even a distinct difference there. They were frequently described back in Europe as strong, exotic, beautiful, and most importantly, unconverted. To Europeans of the time, you didn't exploit Christian people the way that you could the unconverted. I mean, feudalism was a very exploitative practice, but as despicable as it was, it would not even come close to what was about to happen in the Americas. But these new natives, many people in Europe, understood that this was a new world that Columbus has found, something that Columbus would never admit his entire life. These new natives were unconverted heathens, and therefore exploitation of them would not be seen as against the rule of God. So you can imagine that in Europe, these natives caused a stir. News of Columbus's voyages and the natives he brought back spread like wildfire. The letter that he wrote to Ferdinand and Isabella, the Catholic monarchs, was translated into nearly every language in Europe and read all throughout the countries. There was even a version of Columbus's voyages put to verse that was recited in every town and village that it could reach. However, Columbus's promises to the Catholic monarchs had not really been reached. He brought back almost no gold and none of the exotic oriental trade goods that they were expecting. But Columbus did have quite a bit to show for his voyage, and 
in addition to that, made several pretty wild assertions as to what was possible if he was granted another voyage. His first promise was that, despite only recovering a tiny amount of gold, the land overflowed with riches. He was even known to have said that the island of Hispaniola was covered in fields of gold, which, of course, is just... Wait, wait, what's going on? Oh, no. No. No, there's no reason to do this. You can just... Look, there were no fields of gold. So... Okay, seriously, that's enough. That's enough. I'm... I'm so sorry about that. Regardless, there were actually no fields of gold on Hispaniola, but his promises did seem to sway the Catholic monarchs, who granted Columbus a second voyage, with a total of 17 ships and as many as 1,200 soldiers. It was clear that this was no exploration. This was an invasion force. On board Columbus's second voyage, there was a doctor. This doctor, well, he was probably the first person to draw distinctions between the native peoples along what he considered racial and tribal lines. The names that he gave to these tribal peoples are still sometimes used today. However, the distinctions that he made are generally seen to be, well, total nonsense. Um... They're really a source of misinformation and propaganda that the Spanish used to their benefit. The doctor's name was Dr. Diego Alvarez Chanca, and he spoke of two peoples, the Taino, who were known as a peaceful and friendly people, and the Caribs, from whom the Caribbean takes its name, who were said to be a violent and warlike people. There was also mention of a people called the Arawaks, which is typically today the name that is most used to describe the native peoples of the Caribbean, but really all of these names were borrowed from the native peoples, but taken and twisted so that none of them accurately represent the people of the era. Now the Carib, in addition to being violent and warlike, were known to practice a much darker way of life. They were said to be cannibals. Being cannibals, of course, was against the rule of God and against the rule of man, and so qualified the Carib people for extermination. Now, this is important because a further distinction was that the people of the Greater Antilles, the larger islands in the Caribbean, islands such as Cuba and Hispaniola and Puerto Rico, well, those people were said to be the friendly and peaceful Taino, whereas the Caribs lived on the smaller islands of the Bahamas and elsewhere, and if it was okay to completely exterminate these people, well, then it became much easier for the Spanish to set up bases and settlements on these smaller islands without having any fear of the natives. And of course, this distinction is total nonsense. To say that everybody in the Caribbean at the time fell into one of two categories, well, that's just ridiculous. I mean, it's like saying that all Native Americans are the same and that the Cherokee, being a civilized and native tribe were very similar to the Inca, who were a civilized native tribe, when of course their cultures were vastly different, almost unrecognizable to each other. These cultures all saw themselves as separate from their neighbors. They of course had contact and trade and occasional warfare, but they were an entirely different tribal entity. And so what Dr. Alvarez said was merely an excuse for the Spanish to be able to do whatever they wanted in the Caribbean. However, it's entirely possible that cannibalism did actually take place, not along these falsified racial or tribal boundaries, but, well, a French missionary who traveled to the Caribbean in 1693 was quoted as saying, quote, I also know, and it is quite true, that when the English and French first settled in the islands, many men of both nations were killed, buconned, and eaten by the Caribs. But this was due to the inability of the Indians to take revenge on the Europeans for their injustice and cruelty, and it was done with impotent rage, not custom. End quote. In addition to the desire of the Spanish to conquer Caribbean islands without having any fear of natives, there was another reason that they decided it was okay to exterminate entire islands full of human beings. That was what they found when they returned to La Navidad. When they showed up at the first European settlement in the Americas, it was quiet. It was empty. There was not a soul of the 39 men left 
remaining. The natives on that island were particularly close-mouthed as to what happened, too. So the Spanish retaliated. They killed the tribe that they deemed responsible down to every man, woman, and child. This began what is arguably the most horrific genocide in all of human history. Beyond their revenge and desire to exterminate the Carib people from these islands, there was another reason they made that distinction. While they wanted to exterminate all of the natives on the smaller islands, on the larger islands on which they intended to establish large bases and begin mining for gold, well, there simply weren't enough men among the Spanish to do that. So they needed labor, and they were going to find that labor from the native peoples. They were, systematically, to be conquered, converted by force, and enslaved. When the Spanish first began their search for gold, they instituted a practice. They would force the natives of Hispaniola to collect gold. All people above 14 years of age were to collect a certain amount of gold every three months, a quota. Upon receiving the gold, a Spanish official would give the native a copper token that they would hang around their neck. Now, any native that was found without a token, or who was unable to provide his quota of gold, would have their hands cut off and left to bleed to death. It was a horrific time for the natives of Hispaniola and the other islands that the Spanish had made their presence known on. Of course, the natives did resist. They organized as well they could, but they were facing forces of mounted men, wearing armor, carrying muskets, and cold steel, none of which were technologies that the native people had any knowledge of. There was also the issue of disease. See, disease spread so fast in the New World that it's really hard to wrap your mind around. The native people didn't have any resistance to the old world germs and viruses, and they died in record numbers. This happened all throughout the New World, and really it's possible to say that the only people who saw a New World that was untouched, by Europeans at least, were the people on that first voyage of Columbus, because everybody after that saw a world that had been ravaged by the disease of the Europeans. Within two years, from Columbus's first voyage to the Caribbean, half of the natives of Hispaniola were dead. What disease and warfare didn't finish, the encomiendas managed to. See, the natives weren't finding enough gold because there wasn't enough gold to be found, so the Spanish organized these huge plantations, mostly sugar but some other goods, where the natives were worked hard, daily, to death. Before the Spanish arrival, it is estimated that there were 250,000 natives on the island. By 1515, that's only about 20 years later, only 50,000 were left. That's 200,000 dead. By 1550, there was maybe 500 natives left, and a census of 1650 mentioned absolutely no natives of Hispaniola living on the island. Human history has a long and troubled past of terrible atrocities against other human beings. But I'd be hard-pressed to find anything that rivals what is about to happen in the New World to all of the native peoples. These numbers may not exactly be totally accurate. You see, our primary source for this period is a priest. His name was Bartolome de las Casas, and he wrote a multi-volume history of the Indies. It gives us essentially all we know about the period, aside from what the archaeological evidence can show, and even Columbus's writings, including those quotes that I've given in this episode, might be attributed to him, because Columbus's journals were lost at one point until Las Casas discovered them, which, of course, many historians find suspect, but some accept that he just transcribed journals that he found in the New World. At first, Las Casas was complicit in the Spanish conquest of the New World. He even participated actively in the conquest of Cuba. He set up an encomienda there, but owning that encomienda, he got to see firsthand the brutality that was done to the native peoples. So he began a campaign 
against the brutality that was happening to the native people of the Caribbean. He was even given the title of Protector of the Indians. To quote from his numerous writings about the atrocities done to the native peoples, quote, Endless testimonies prove the mild and pacific temperament of the natives, but our work was to exasperate, ravage, kill, mangle, and destroy. End quote. Las Casas had a simple solution to the problem of the atrocities done to the natives to ensure that the Spanish had a labor force. His solution was to once again try importing African slaves to work on the encomiendas. Now, eventually he did relent on this, seeing the suffering of the African peoples. He added them to his campaign of freeing the enslaved on Hispaniola. But it was, of course, too late. The Africans were, in many ways, indeed superior to the natives. They were not susceptible to the diseases of the Old World, considering that they had had much contact with the Old World and developed immunities to them. In addition, they were far from home. They had been torn from their families and the land that they had known their entire lives, so they were less able to organize resistance than the native peoples. In merely a hundred years from the time that the Spanish began importing African slaves, by the year 1600, there were around 100,000 people that had been kidnapped, put in chains, and transported across the Atlantic. And that doesn't even count the untold numbers of men and women that died en route. This atrocious pattern continued all across the Caribbean, and even onto the mainland of the New World. The Spanish would conquer, through whatever means necessary, enslave the native people until nearly all of them were dead, and then begin to import African replacements for them. Within a mere number of decades, the Spanish had conquered the mainland. The conquistador Hernán Cortés defeated the Aztecs of Mexico, and that's a story that is mythical in scope. One of his deputies, a man named Pizarro, did the exact same thing to the Inca Empire in South America. These were two warlike, great, large, and powerful empires that had been completely destroyed and turned into massive mining colonies for the Spanish, creating amazing amounts of gold and silver that they were going to smelt and ship back to Spain. At first, they did this in gold and silver bars, but eventually they were sending minted coins back to Spain in larger numbers than Spain could ever hope to produce on its own. This solidified the beginning of the first truly global empire, one that spanned both hemispheres. It was a rival to, and perhaps even surpassed, the empires of Alexander, or the Romans, or even the Mongols. Their empire was unparalleled in its power. That power was due to the money that they were creating. It was so influential, in fact, that our modern dollar sign, here in the U.S. and in other countries, was actually first coined by the Spanish. See, the dollar sign, or something very similar to it, appeared on their minted pieces of eight, which are, of course, going to become very important to our story of Caribbean piracy in a very short amount of time. If you think about the dollar sign, it looks kind of like an S with two lines drawn through it. On the piece of eight, those two lines represented the Pillars of Hercules, which is essentially where the Spanish Empire began. And the what we would think of as an S on the pieces of eight looked a little bit more like a representation of the two hemispheres, which showed that the coins minted there were a symbol of the hemisphere spanning power of the Spanish Empire. These pieces of eight, of course, became so prevalent in the Caribbean and around Europe that even today the symbol printed on them means money. So, in a record amount of time, we have brushed through the creation of what is potentially the greatest empire the world has ever known. But whatever happened to the man who discovered that empire? Who found the lands upon which that empire would be forged? Christopher Columbus. Well, Columbus was eventually granted a governorship, the governorship of Hispaniola. He made a total of four voyages. However... He disagreed and conflicted with the Spanish monarchs on a number of issues, and eventually his rank as admiral, as well as his governorship, were revoked. 
and he went back to Spain, where he fell into near madness. Not entirely insane, but he became quite unhinged. And it was there that he died a very, very rich man. And of course, Columbus never admitted that he had found the New World. He asserted, even until his death, that he had found a sea route to Asia, something even his son, who was a governor in the Caribbean, knew to be false, which is probably why his name does not christen the New World. Another explorer, Amergo Vespucci, who explored extensively in the New World, got that honor of having his name and printed upon this large, fertile, and glorious land known as the Americas. I think that'll just about do it for this week. I brushed past a lot of very, very big topics, but considering the scope of what I was trying to cover, I think I can be forgiven. I do want to go into some of these big topics in more depth, topics like the native peoples of the Caribbean, the conquest of the Americas, and of course, slavery. However, I'm not going to do that next week. I think it's about time we move on with our story. I'm toying with some different ways to get these episodes to you, perhaps offering a membership option that will allow people to get access to special episodes or some other way to reward loyal listenership. Next week, we're going to be covering the religious divide in Europe that led to many of the conflicts in the Caribbean that were a direct cause of piracy. This is going to lead to characters like Martin Luther, Henry VIII, and Queen Elizabeth. There have been several big advancements in the world of the Pirate History Podcast, first of them being that we now have a website. That's piratehistorypodcast.com. Over there, you can find maps as well as pictures and some supplemental information to the episodes. The website also now has a donation button through PayPal. If there are any wonderfully kind souls out here that are enjoying the podcast and would like to help support it, we'd really appreciate it. Donations help keep the podcast afloat and offset the cost of things like hosting and research materials. The theme music was, as always, The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you found that you'd enjoyed it, why not go on over and check them out at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G dot com dot A-U. After you're done over there, why not go on over and check us out at piratehistorypodcast.com, follow us on Twitter at Black Flagcast, or go ahead and like us on Facebook. Every little bit helps get the podcast noticed. Most importantly, I really hope you enjoyed yourselves. Thank you for listening. Tonight